How are you guys doing today? It's nice to be up here. There's friends. I saw Lori. Where'd you go? I didn't imagine you. You're here. <laughs> this is my childhood best friend here, man. This, I probably the only person who probably knows the most about me <laughs> from like here, diapers up. So there's a table there. I didn't see that. There we go. All right, guys. Um, I, just, I got a quick story I want to share with you. Um, I, I had a message ready to go, and every once in a while I get to preach the one I have prepared. And then around 10 o'clock last night, I was like praying, and I'm like, oh no, we're changing it. Okay, Jesus, here we go. <laughs> So here we are. We're going to be changing the message. So um, uh, in my early 20s, 24, 25, around there, I was finishing my master's degree at University of the Pacific here just around the corner, and I was going for biology. And there's that kind of stage where you're done with all your coursework, but you're putting the finishing touches on your thesis and trying to get it published, whatnot. And so I was in that weird spot, and I was tired, right? And all my courses had posted in my transcripts so I could go get a job. And I'd always wanted to teach, and so I decided to apply to Delta College. And I had such a great experience there as a student that I was like, okay, I'm gonna go teach there. So I applied for an adjunct position as a biology professor, and uh, one of my colleagues was, comes in the morning service. I was like, she can attest to how hard the interview process is there. It's, it's really, it's, it's not fun. It's painful. And so I get done with the interview, and you know, if you've ever interviewed for your, you know, your big girl job, your big boy job, and I get in the parking lot, and I'm like, whew, right? And going through all my answers, like, did I screw that up? Did I get that? No, I got it. I'm feeling like pretty confident. And I get a phone call before I even get to the car, and it's the dean. And the dean's like, hey, Bethany, I, I'm so sorry. There's been a big mistake. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 right? You're that, ugh. And he goes, no, you, the job's yours, actually. And so I felt relieved. He goes, but I made a mistake. You're supposed, I told you you would be teaching um, general biology. You know? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, because that's what I could do with all my coursework, right? I'm like, you could teach general biology. And he's like, no, I need you to teach um, the availabilities for human anatomy. I was like, oh, okay. Well, there's a slight problem. He's like, well, what is that? I go, I've never had the course. I, I don't even know, like, nothing. <laughs> and Because I, I just did all this, micro I can tell you anything about bacteria and parasites and funky diseases and fungus. Like, that's my wheelhouse. I got that. And so he goes, well, do you know how to read? I went, yes, I think so. And he goes, well, school starts in a week. Get yourself a textbook. Let's go. And I went, you know when you're not supposed to say yes and you hear yes coming out of your mouth? I went, okay, sure, no problem. And then, like, the sheer panic that came over me at that point, like, oh, man, I have officially stepped in it. Like, it is bad. And I'm too embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed to admit this to you. But, like, I couldn't name, Caitlin's laughing because she's a bio major. Okay, Nikkei, I couldn't name a bone in my body, and I would be hurting for school. Like, I mean, it was really bad. I was like, I, I, and I was trying. I was like, I, I can't even actually think of a name of a bone in my, femur, maybe. That was reaching. Okay, so that, I, that does happen, okay? You're, all the college kids are like, my professor probably doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> now I'm great at it. It's probably my best class. There are times where we're called to be available, irregardless of our ability. Okay? First slide up there, guys, that availability is our greatest ability. And that's a football quote. Okay, Bill Parcell, and I don't even know football, which is sad, but whatever, right? Okay, and he's, he, the context was, he goes, it doesn't matter how good any individual player is, it, sh it matters who shows up on the field that day, especially with COVID, I imagine, right? Okay, like, we could have the greatest stacked team in the whole world, but like, whoever shows up, that's who's playing, and that's what we have. So, the availability is the key piece. Maybe you've been at work, and you know, someone calls out sick or they show they have, they're gone on leave for a reason. And your boss like scrambling because they have this spot, they have this project that needs to be done. And they're looking around and they're like, hey, you, yeah, you, you. And you're like, me, what? And like, you could do this. And you know, you're not qualified. They don't have the training, don't have anything. And like, you just get put there. And then you end up actually learning pretty fast and probably could be halfway decent at this job, right? Maybe in sports, someone was injured and like they pulled your butt off the bench and they know you're not good, but man, you had heart and you had passion and you're gonna play till you had everything on the field and you end up helping your team. So we know of stories like that, right? Where people just showed up and said, yes, like 
I know I'm not qualified to do this, but I'll be there. And so availability is our greatest ability. So the question I want us to answer today is, what is it that God has asked you to do or has instructed you to do? And you're too worried, worrying about inadequacy, insecurities, lack of qualifications or ability. Like you're just too stuck there. So we're gonna take a look at Moses. And Moses, and I just wanna do some background because maybe this is your first time to church and someone invited you and you've heard of Moses but you don't really know the story. In Egypt, the Pharaoh there, he had started to take an unkind view of the Israelites. They were becoming very, uh, they were popular, they had grown strong, they had huge numbers and he's like, these guys could probably overtake us. So he started turning it to where they were his slaves and he was beating them and forcing them and driving them to build new cities for him. And so he's trying to take these people out and keep them in check. And so one way that he was gonna do that was to have every newborn baby boy killed and only save the girls. And if they happened to be born and make it past that and they were doing that, and he goes, okay, we're gonna take all the boys and we're just gonna throw them, there's babies, in. okay, um, editing. Okay, they're gonna go in the river, all right? We got that part? Okay. And so now they're in the river, so it's genocide. And so he's, this is the context that Moses comes. He's a baby that's saved and he's put in a basket and he's floated down the river and his sister's watching him and Pharaoh's daughter rescues him and at, at a turn of events, Moses' mom ends up being his nurse for a few years. So Moses is raised in an Egyptian house with an Egyptian culture and mentality. He's raised in Pharaoh's house. But as he's growing, he's seeing the people who look like him being abused and overworked and beaten. And he, took, he had his limit. He saw one guy getting beat and he took the Egyptian soldier and he killed him. And so word starts getting around that Moses is the guy that killed the Egyptian soldier. So he has to get because Pharaoh has had it and he's hot and he wants Moses killed. So Moses goes off to a region called Midian and he's out in the desert. He meets a woman, marries her, Zipporah, and then he starts working for her father-in-law as a shepherd, Jethro. And so this is where we pick up Moses' story. He's been out in the desert, he's a shepherd, and he's working for his father-in-law. And one day he looks over and he sees this bush that's on fire. And it's like weird, it's not being burned up, it's not being consumed, right? So this is where we're gonna pick it up in Exodus chapter three. And at chapter three and four, you can read the whole thing at home. I'm gonna just kinda pick a few key scriptures. Verse four. It says, when the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Number five, do not come any closer, God said, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Now, if you've been in church long enough, you've been a believer a long time, you know this passage really well. And we've, we've talked about the holy moments and the awesome and the presence of God. We know this real well. Verse six, he says, then he said, I am your God the God of your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And at this Moses, he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So in this moment, like they've heard these stories passed down generation after generation of Abraham and the covenant, right? And the legacy that's coming bigger, you know, more descendants in the stars. They've heard about Jacob building the altar, right? And the stairway to heaven, all these amazing stories that have been passed down. So Moses now realizes who he's officially speaking to. It's not just this weird mystical spirit in a bush. It is the God. Verse seven. The Lord says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Verse 8, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into right, the promised land, this place flowing with milk and honey that's prosperous. And so, verse 9, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Next slide. When you look at these verses, we see God has finally seen, he has heard, he is concerned, and he has come to the, he is coming to the rescue. At this point, right? Hey, Moses has to be like, 
vindicated, like, man, yeah, I saw my people, like, you should have seen what happened to all the babies, okay, I'm lucky to be alive, all the other guys, they've gotten beat, I killed one, like, there's, like just a justice has to rise up in his heart, and a, a hope, like, we're gonna get rescued, God, and, you know, when you finally see your hope coming, man, you, maybe he's envisioning God's using bolts of lightning or earthquakes or volcanoes, I don't know what he has in his head, but, like, God's gonna take care of this in a really big way demonstrative way. Exodus 3.10, God says, so now go. What? Moi? Me? What? What are you talking about? That's all God says. So now go. I, and Moses like, wait, no, you saw, you heard, you are concerned, you are coming to the rescue. And God just says, so now go. Keeps going, verse 10, I am sending you to Pharaoh, that guy who wanted to kill you, that guy that you're out here in the desert running from him. I'm sending you right to him to bring my people out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? Hey, who am I? And then he says, he goes on, he said, God said, I will be with you, okay? I'm gonna go with you. And there's gonna be a sign that when you come back out here in this desert, you're gonna worship me on this mountain. And we know that as we read the story of Exodus, right? He ends up going to that Mount Sinai and he gets the 10 commandments and he meets with God and that sign does happen. Okay, how many of you have, you know, if you've, who's ever tried to negotiate with a toddler? <laughs> and lost? Okay, this could be your kid, your niece, your nephew, anybody's kid, the kid in Sunday school, doesn't matter. Little snotty nosed kid down the street. Okay, and you try to negotiate with a toddler. Okay, well, that's another sermon. Okay, <laughs> you don't negotiate with toddlers. Okay, but whatever. We all do it. Okay, because it's a power battle, right? They win all the time. They always win. Okay, they should teach the CIA how to win. They do it. Okay, and so at this point, Moses, if God says, I'm going to go with you, the signs you're going to meet me on this mountain. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of your fathers. I'm talking you, to you from a burning bush. At this point, it should be enough. Like, okay, I'll go do it. I will go, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll go. But no, the toddler spirit shows up. Verse 13, Moses said to God, so suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? What am I gonna tell them? Okay, and God responds, 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you say to the Israelites. I am <coughs> has sent me to you. Okay. And I don't mean to make a joke, or, okay, because I am, if you know, it's, it's powerful, right? This is a, big, a very powerful passage. Okay. If you, your mom has ever told you, or you're the mom who has said this, you know like when your mom just says, because I said so? Like no other explanation needed, because I said so? Or, um, I cannot use this when my kids show up. But yesterday, um, Hannah, and there's a whole gaggle of neighborhood kids. I'm, I mean, they played in my garage and they blew my garage up. Like they blew it up. It's bad. It's like utter chaos in that garage. Paint and toys and papers and crap and stuff. To, I mean, just overturned. You know, okay, you can't, you know when a room gets blown up? That is my garage, right? Okay. And so Jeff and I both hit our limit yesterday. Yesterday was short day and we just looked at Hannah and you know how your kid's sweet and then they turn into something else? And then I said, go, you're, gonna, you're cleaning the garage. And she's like, but they did it. Okay, well, I'm like, well, they can help you. They can go, what am I gonna tell them? What am I gonna tell so-and-so? I just say, you tell them your mom said to get your butt over here and come clean this garage. So I can hear, my mom said to get your butts over here and clean our house. <laughs> And they did, those kids, have, they worked for hours. Man, they whined and they complained and they grumbled. It's still not clean, it's still a mess. But you know what I mean, they hated it. But there are times where we have that because I said so, just go. That authority should be enough to make your kid run. Doesn't always work, but there is a tone and an authority that will make your kid run. Okay. So God starts dropping credentials at this point. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, okay, well, if I am that I am is not enough, you tell him I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac, and I'm the God of Jacob. They know the stories and the miracles. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Moses is not done. He keeps talking. Do you know when your kid keeps talking back to you? 
Okay, and negotiations haven't stopped. Verse four, Moses answered, well, what if they don't believe me? Well, what if they say the Lord did not appear to you? Like, you're, this, they didn't tell you that. Okay, the Lord said, well, what's in your hand? And he gives them three signs. I won't read all of them, but he just, I'll tell you what they are. He has a staff in his hand. And he says, throw that staff on the ground and it turns into a snake. Pick it up. It turns back into a staff. Next slide for me. And he goes, okay, that's cool. I need another sign. He goes, okay, put your hand in your jacket. Now pull it out. And it turned leprosy on it. Put it back in. Look at it again. It's healed. There's sign two to show how miraculous and powerful I am. Moses says, still not enough. I need another sign. And he says, okay, you go take the, river, the, the water out of the Nile River and put some on the ground and it turns to blood. And he goes, okay. So he has his three signs. He's got the God of the universe, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the burning bush. He has all of this. I am that I am. He has his miraculous signs and wonders. And then we go to verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, and I love this little phrase here, nor since you started talking to me for the last 45 minutes. I haven't gotten any better at this. We have been talking. I have not improved. If you were going to do something, you had 45 minutes with this burning bush to do the miracle. He says, I'm slow of speech and tongue. Maybe he stuttered. Maybe he had an impediment, right? Whatever it might have been. But he wasn't a great public speaker. And the Lord is officially starting to be done with Moses. He responds to Moses. He says, who gives you your mouth? Who makes you deaf or mute? Who gave you those eyes so you could see? Who could make you blind? I, now, okay, verse 12, he repeats himself. Now go, go. I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Moses is getting to the end of God's thread. And 13, but Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Here he comes back with another one. Lord, please just send someone else. So have you ever thought that, like it's someone else's job to do the thing God called you to do? They could do it, they're more qualified. They got it, God. They can, they can write, sing, dance, perform, build. They're logistically, they have admin skills. They're, they've got it, God. They're stronger, they're better, they could do it. Verse 14, this is not a good emotion for the Lord to have towards us. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Have you ever, I'm using the kid analogy, but you could apply this to other things, but have you ever told your kid to do something so many times that you officially have hit your stinking limit and you just like wanna grab them and snatch them and be like, Rrr. okay, anybody, ever, is it just me? You wanna snatch your kid up and be like, excuse me, I have told you 15 two times to go clean your room, okay, move. Now, that's what I say all the time. My kids probably could repeat that. Move it now, okay? Because I, I, I won't even go there. It's like watching molasses move backwards. <laughs> it's the truth. We're going to go to Disneyland. Underwear's on. They're packing. Suitcases are like in the car. They've been waiting for you for 45 minutes in the car. Ethan will wait an hour in the car if we're going somewhere cool. I'm like, can you please? We spend 30 minutes putting underwear on for church. That is not an exaggeration. He puts one arm in, leg in, walks with this leg around the bed about three times. <laughs> takes it off, puts the other leg in, walks with that leg around. I mean, it's the fact, I don't judge my kids' clothes. If they are not in suit and ties, be thankful to our pants, underwear, and shirt on them with what we go through before Sundays. They have clothes on. We get points. Okay? Anybody, come on, guys. Amen. Amen. So the Lord's anger burned against Moses. He said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? He went to college. I know he can speak well. He's already on his way. He'll meet you and he'll be glad to see you. He will speak to the people for you and it'll be a, as <coughs> he were your mouth, as if you were God. Now you've got the God job. You've got to tell him what to say. Take your, your security blanket, your staff, so you can do signs with it. Take your binky, 15, and you shall speak and put words in his mouth and I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. So Moses has negotiated with God and he still has to 
go. So there's four things that he questions. First one, he questions his own credibility. God, what if they don't believe me? I am nobody. I have no titles. I have no, uh, I don't have a degree here. Like, I, they're not going to believe me. Who am I to do this? <clears throat> he questioned his ability to speak. Like, God, you have been talking to me for 45 minutes. You obviously see that I am struggling here. Why in the world are you sending me out to talk to these people? He questioned, who am I? Like, I'm out here in the back 40 of the desert, and, like, you're sending me, the guy who killed the Egyptians, who's trying to be killed by the Pharaoh? Like, this, I'm the wrong person for the job. And he questions God's identity, right? What's your name? Who are you? Like, are you sure you're even this God? We all do this. We question our abilities, our qualifications, our, our breed, right? Our genealogy, who we are, what we come from. I didn't come from that family line. I didn't come from that. Why are you picking me and asking me to do this? God has called us to something, but we come up with our list, our beautiful list of excuses. Maybe you've never said this in your life. Number one, I can't because. Because what? I can't because is not a reason, it's an excuse. Have you ever heard this out of someone else's mouth? Not your own, because you're perfect. <laughs> I'm perfect, you're perfect, we're all perfect. It's the other services that really need this. <laughs> not the 930, you guys are shining stars. Hall of Famers in here. Yeah, right? <laughs> Gonna need it in a minute, we haven't got to the end. <laughs> are you sure you picked the right person? Are you sure? Like when we feel this, like, eh, yeah, that's not my jam. I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. No, that's not me. Don't ask me to serve in the nursery. They'll be dead babies. Okay. I didn't say that. Okay. I probably rephrased that. Okay, I think it every time. I'm like, I'd rather clean the toilets. I'll clean all the toilets first. It's because I just got out of baby season. Ask me when I'm 50. Okay. Don't I need to, this is, I think, a religious thing right here. Don't I need to do X, Y, and Z before I'm qualified to do that? And if you've been raised in a certain mentality, a certain way, there's usually a, a mindset that you have to get over, like I need to be good enough, perfect enough, daughter, cross the list of 10 things that I need to do before I'm qualified to go out there and do that, right? And you know, I'm not even gonna joke. There are some times, like when people serve and you're like, you're, you're looking at them like little Mick Judgy, looking at them because you know they're pal. Like maybe it's someone you know from another lifetime and they show up to Life Song and they're out there serving and loving people, and, but you know them, like really know them. And you're like, oh, they should have been through a screening process or something. <laughs> there's, a, there's a something that they did not pass to go do that job. You guys all thought it, huh? <laughs> But God's not looking at their past. He's looking at their future. He's looking at what they can do and who they can be. Okay? You are, they are unqualified. Absolutely unqualified, probably. But they said yes, and they showed up on game day. So they're being used. Last one, I need more time, or I need, I, my favorite one, I need to pray about this. Okay, there's a lot of things that we should wait and pray about. Okay, probably 80% of this stuff. Does that make sense? I'm not, I'm not minimizing the F of waiting and hearing from God. But there's some stuff, it's a pretty simple yes or no. And rather than pulling this whole list out, just have some integrity and say no. Exactly. Not, I can't, I won't, are you sure? Not me, maybe later. I haven't heard from the Lord yet, we'll see. Okay, this is just a whole list of excuses from the pit of hell, okay? The, enemy wants to keep you out of the game and so the th when I was praying in the first service I felt like I gotta go so I'm gonna step on some toes probably it's okay we have band-aids outside you can bandage them up I was praying and I, I felt like I need to go after a little bit of an icky spirit a spirit of criticism okay. if you, you, we all know what the term armchair quarterback is is that, like you're not in the game, you're the, okay, today's perfect. You guys are all gonna go watch a football game, right? And you're gonna be yelling at the TV, you're gonna be yelling at the coaches, you're gonna yell at some refs because you know better, right? You would have done a different play, you would have done something else, you would have called a timeout at a different play, you know, you would have done, a, you would have put someone else in the game because you know way better than they do. 
because you're the expert. <laughs> All 250 pounds of you, okay, is sitting there eating. Go! But if we put your butt out on the field, we couldn't get past the 10-yard line. We'd be like, <gasps> okay? And I'm not just picking on the football guys a little bit, right? But because the ones who got a lot to say are usually doing the least. Okay? They got a lot to say. They don't like this. They don't like that. That could be done better. What about this? How come this? And you know what? And, and we kind of even get in that weird mentality of like the church is not the four walls. We should be out doing this. We could be that, 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 that. Okay, all that stuff, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with those statements, Okay? The problem is, is that critical spirit gets in us and we start just criticizing and poking at the body, the church, whatever, you just pick something, right? Okay, let me tell you a little secret about this church and probably every other church in the Stockton. I'll just use ours. Okay. God put a bunch of Moseses in charge of this place. We are not the most qualified. We need more training. We're not the best speakers. We're not the most whatever. And are we gonna screw something up? Absolutely. Are we gonna cause this church to, and I, Pastor James has heard all of this, so I'm clear, okay? Because I say it's not a discredit to him, okay? But there, there are better, more professionally trained preachers, pastors, administrators. Like we, we, you know what the difference is? We said yes, we put a big yes to God. When he called, we just said yes. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm not trained in seminary. I am literally trained in parasites, guys. Nine years of studying bacteria and parasites. That is what I'm trained to do. Literally trained to do. Okay? But I have said yes to God my whole life. And when that thing creeps up in us, that critical thing, it's usually, because like if you walk into the church, I was using an example of Pastor James earlier, man, when I worked here on staff, nothing would bug him more than little bits of peep, uh, paper on the ground, right? And if we walked past it as a staff or a volunteer and you didn't pick that piece, like Disneyland, you know how you never see trash at Disneyland because they all pick it up, right? Everybody, doesn't matter what you are, president down to the grunt, okay? And so here, I mean, if we walk past a piece of paper and don't pick it up and put it in the trash, you can get, you probably get fired on the spot, okay? Because just, you just don't do that. And it's because it bugs him, right? That bugs him. Everybody's going to be the cleanest church we've ever had. <laughs> Picking up trash all day long. Hey, when you see something that bugs you, it's generally the thing you're called to do. Okay? So when I walk around in here and I see something that's off or a system that's off or something, and I'm like, ooh, man, we got to fix that. We need to get that in shape. Pastor James needs to tell someone. needs to tell Daniel. He has been slacking. <laughs> Man, someone should tell him, right? And then you just get that little gentle nudge from the Holy Spirit, like, you are perfectly capable and no one else notices, so it's probably your job. Not happy with the system? Go fix the system. Does that make sense? Man, there's not enough nursery workers. That nursery takes forever. That check-in, man, that pickup line takes forever. Just let the silence settle. <laughs> I'm surprised I don't hear Roy just like amening and running aisles at this point. <laughs> Does that make sense? You guys, I'm driving the point a little extra, but you got it? Okay. God has called you to do something. He's instructed you to do something. And it's a go now, not go later, go in five years, go in three months, go now. I don't, each of us has different talents and abilities and leanings, right? Some of us are creative. Some of us are administrative. Some of us are like speaking and some of us want to uh, create systems in the background. Some of us are entrepreneurs. Some of us are going to be uh, catalysts for change in education and policy. We are going to be out there. We're going to be people leading. Maybe we're running for office, but there's a whole kingdom. Yes, be beyond the four walls. So let me take it past the church systems, right? Because we have our own systems here. But beyond there, you don't like something in the community that's going down, homelessness, homelessness, crime, whatever, go volunteer and sign up. You don't like how a law is being changed, go write a letter, run for office to do something. You must say, there's a, there's a need for a business here. They don't have this. This should be done. God's saying, 
Go now. I'm using kingdom people to infiltrate the community that you can be kingdom builders in Stockton, California, in San Joaquin Valley. Go do the thing I've put in you. I gave you that creativity. I've given you that ability. I gave you that knowledge. And we're sitting here like, I am not qualified enough to do it. I don't have it, God. I am so inadequate. He goes, you're not qualified and you don't have it. And you can't do it without my help. And they will know that it's you, me in you. And I get the glory for it. That's the, that's because when people see you doing it, they're like, there is no way they could. Nope, not them. They are no, they're not trained for that. We know them. So when you're doing it, when you're recording the album, when you're writing the book, when you've made the law, when you've built the business, they see the hand of God on it. And the consequence of us saying no, okay, This is the consequence. If Moses really just hardlined there with God and said, I am not going, you're sending Aaron, I am literally not moving because I'm just not moving, okay? I'm sure God would have found another plan, but look at what Moses did. He led them out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, through the desert. It was a bumpy ride, but the cloud was there, the fire was there. He built the tabernacle, He wrote the Ten Commandments with God. He received that. He was in that moment as they're being written. Okay? Even there was a lot of stuff going wrong, he still was the person facilitating the next generation getting to the promised land. All that because of one really inadequate guy. God used that. What would have happened if he said no? So we don't realize the power of our no sometimes. When we say no, what is the cost to our city? What is the cost to the kingdom? Who's not getting saved? Who's not being rescued from hell? Who's not advancing their lives? Whose marriage is not staying saved? Does that make sense? What's the consequence of my no? God, I I felt this one. I'm going for it. I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not a good enough provider. They don't need me. I'm out. That someone's thinking, I don't know who this is. is, this is special for this one. They don't need me, they don't respect me, they, she can do this without me. They don't love me, they don't need me. You're feeling that right now when you come home, right? And when guys don't feel wanted or respected, right, they start to bounce. Even though they don't wanna bounce, they start to want to bounce. Let me just pause you right there, whoever's fighting that demon. What's the consequence of you following all the way through with that decision? Okay. Just play it out in your head a little bit. Let it, let it go. Okay. I'm not, there's some crazy situations out there. I get it that, you know, we're not doing that right now. I'm just talking about like, I'm playing with the idea of going because I don't feel good, and it's, it's, you're, you're feeling, I don't feel good enough. I cannot be the husband and father. I cannot be the leader she needs. You can't, but God can in you. Guys, God can do it in you. He can do a miracle in your life. With the help of God, you can be the leader. You can be the provider. You can be the, da- you can do it. You can lead your family out of Egypt. You can do it. He will use you. She wants you to do it, and God will help you to do it. And wives, this is a little note for us, it's so hard, get out of the way. Take this, shut it down, go to your prayer closet, and get out of his way, and let him do it. That was hard to hear, huh? All wives are looking up, husbands are looking down, <laughs> people are elbowing, I could feel it's tense in here, I get it. Okay, welcome to, ooh. all right, stand up with me. Was this helpful to any of you? All right. 
I was telling some of the girls last week, I was like, Life Song, we've got to raise the standard for ourselves and stop just doing bottom level expectations and jobs. Like, raise the bar for ourselves and do what God has called us to do. Let's change our community and our city, our state, our nation. What can we do when uh, the yes? Father God, I thank you so much for the anointing that's in this room. God, I pray for the anointing to rest on each and every one of us. God, I pray that there will be such incredible creations and projects and podcasts and books and movies and records, God, that will change the city. I pray for, for nonprofits to be born, God. I pray for homeless uh, ministries to be born out of this, God. I pray for marriage ministries, God, grief ministries, all of the things that are in our hearts, God, to be birthed from today because there's a whole group of people that are saying, I, have, I don't have it together, I don't have the training, I don't have the facilities, and I don't have the money. But God, you can come through and you can do it in me so I can save people, so I can save souls, so people will go to heaven because of my yes today. Let, we will never know the full impact, God, of what you're going to do through one simple yes. But God, if you can speak through a donkey, you can speak through a girl. So God, I pray for an empowering voice. I pray for the women real quick, an empowering voice for our young women and our women who feel like they can't lead or they can't speak or they can't do, that the anointing will fall on you and he will use you as a beacon and a light and a mouthpiece to save people and to witness and to be a hope for the lost. God, I pray that you will be with our families this week. I pray for your blessing and your healing power and your anointing to go with everyone today. And everyone said, amen.